Yes, so um, this is a PDF of the Magma Handbook chapter on hypergeometric motors. I don't know what the actual chapter number is currently, it's in like 133, but um, I've you know, recompiled so it shows up as chapter one. So I'm just going to go, go through various things in this handbook chapter that's about 30 pages long. We'll, I'll give some examples, but first I want to motivate um, on what hypergeometric motives are, um, just introduce what they are, and um, the word motive here is um, conjectural in most cases, so um, for the motivation we'll look at hypergeometric differential equations. I'm sure that many of you will know this, I guess what Tosh talked about a little bit in this class yesterday. So um, what are um, hypergeometric differential equations? So of course the easiest case was done by Gauss and probably Euler on the 2f1, so here I have n, f, n minus 1. So in general, we take n tuples of, can be in general as complex numbers. When we get to arithmetic applications, we'll want to, um, to take these to be rationals. Um, and we consider this a generalized hypergeometric differential equation, um, where theta is um, z times the d of derivative with respect to z. And this has um, um, regular singularities at 0, 1, and infinity. And um, for simplicity of exposition, we take the betas to be distinct modulo 1. Otherwise, we'll end up with um, extra logarithmic terms. And then a basis of solutions around the point is equal to 0 um, are given by these hypergeometric functions n, f, n minus 1, which are defined um, on the next line, um, times this part here, which um, um, need not be homomorphic. And, um, if the di is um, congruent to 0 minus the 1, then I guess it is. And this v here means that you ignore the term bi minus bi plus 1 that would ordinarily um, be in here. So um, this gives you the solutions around z equals 0. Um, you can switch the alphas with the betas, and that corresponds to a z goes to 1 over z map that switches 0 and infinity, so you could um, equally well do things around infinity. Um, what else do I want to say? And around 1, it's a theory of, it's a theory of Polkammer. I guess he did more than just invent this symbol. Um, he showed that the above differential equation has n minus 1 independent holomorphic solutions around c equals 1. So, um, and thus, from the standpoint of monodromy, um, what do we do? So we can take the, um, the fundamental group of the um, being spirit punctured at these three points, zero, one, infinity. We can take a local solution space around a base point that will depend upon our data, the uh, complex numbers that we have, alpha and beta. Then we have a monodromy representation from the fundamental group to GLN of this solution space. And if we take um, small loops about 0, 1, and infinity, this will give us the um, um, monodromy. And we find that um, uh, evaluating this representation of G0, we'll have, I think I've got the signs right here, the eigenvalues e to the minus 2 pi i of the betas and e to the 2 pi i of the alphas. And I'm sure that Fernando probably disagrees. Yeah. <laughs> he, he always says things differently than I do with this. Normalization. And so this um, implies that we're only concerned with the alphas and betas module 1 when we consider um, monotrony. So um, I think this theorem of Levelt was mentioned yesterday. That um, so this theorem of Polkammer implies that m of g one has n minus one eigenvalues all equal to one. So this element is a pseudo reflection. And then if we have a subgroup of G O and C that's generated by A and B with A times B inverse a pseudo reflection, then um, the this PhD thesis of Levelt tells us exactly when this is irreducible, and he, he gives us a way of um, realizing um, the, the, the eigenvalues. Given the eigenvalues, you, 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 you can compute an A and B, etc., cetera, um, and do this quite explicitly. So that's the classical picture over C. So 
Well, let me go up. So what if I wanted to try to do something arithmetic with this? So I have a, 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 a differential equation, and I have some solution space, and there's some monitor on the above. So you might think of doing thing, just viewing this um, differential equation instead of over C as a p-adic differential equation over um, CP or something. And I think that Chiron will take this up at this time. Um, that's not um, how the, the um, magma implementation um, works per se. So um, instead, we kind of cut to the chase and we use various conjectures, particularly by Fernando. So um, given a hypergeometric datum, so I'll say more about what that is, then um, he conjectures the existence of a family of pure motives and um, cats, which book of cats is this? Hypergeometric sums? Exponential sums and differential equations. Yes, yes. Exponential sums and differential equations. Cats defines a hypergeometric trace, and this, without having to deal with any sort of periodic differential equations, Fernando says that this is the right thing and that should spit out um, um, Euler factors. So we have a hypergeometric datum, we give it a prime, and it gives us back an Euler factor. And then we glue together all these Euler factors for the prime, so this gives us a a, a global L function. So, um, um, for mathematical purposes, these eigenvalues should be roots of unity, and sets of them should be Gal invariant. That will ensure that the motive is defined over Q. And that, in that case, that means we can specify the hypergeometric data as two products of cyclotomic polynomials and the products being co prime. I'll give you um, lots of examples of this. So once we have that data, then we can define an Euler factor via this hypergeometric trace. You can skip a whole bunch of things here. So there's various things corresponding to the motive, such as the weight. There's a formula for it. Um, there's various scaling parameters. There's various things attached to it. Perhaps the most important thing we saw um, yesterday in um, Bartosz talk, he had a way of passing from the rational numbers, the alphas and the betas, to via um, a Rubius inversion to what I call the gamma array. And this corresponds to, instead of taking cyclotomic polynomials, you take things in the form x to the d minus 1. So whatever these things are, um, these will give you Gauss sums. And these Gauss sums are the things that go into the hypergeometric traits. So this is the definition of the hypergeometric trace at Q. So maybe I'll unravel what it is here. So we have a type molar character. We have some scaling parameter M that depends upon a hypergeometric data. We have our specialization T. So T is any rational, or you can more generally make it um, any algebraic number that's not 0, 1, or infinity. So that's what corresponds um, to this um, I point to the complex plane before. So this is our specialization. Uh, we have to avoid the singularities, although later on we will allow t to be 1. That turns out to give a special hypergeometric modus. So this, um, we have a sum from r equals 0 to q minus 2, and we raise the type molar of this to the rth power. And then we have um, this scaling of the Gauss sum product evaluated at r. So the Gauss sums, we have one for um, each um, um, element modulo q, and we evaluate it and we raise it to this gamma of <coughs> And there's various technicalities with scaling that I don't think that much. So this gives us the hypergeometric trace. So that's the thing that we are interested in from the arithmetic point of view. Okay. Yeah. And then from the hypergeometric trace, of course, we have the standard recipe to go from this to an um, order factor. And um, it's known what the local functional equation is, and in the good case, it's known what it should look like um, in the um, in, in, uh, other cases. Okay, so I'll briefly describe, I'll briefly just go through all the magma functions that are available. So there's various ways of creating a hypergeometric datum. So, what, so remember, a hypergeometric datum is something that you then specialize at t. So this is somehow a global object that depends upon um, two pairs of products of cyclotomic polynomials. And then you're going to want to specialize this at t equals 
there's some rational that's not zero to infinity, and then um, you're going to look at every prime, um, and you're going to compute the order of back of each of these. That would be a typical way of doing things. So um, the two typical ways of identifying, of um, defining this are to either take sequences of rationals or products of cyclotomic polynomials. And there's other ways of doing it. I don't think I need to mention them there. I think it's easier to see this by an example when I get to that. Um, other useful functionality about a hypergeometric data is the twist. So twisting corresponds to adding, um, in this case, one half. It's taking the quadratic twist to all the rationals, alpha and beta, that gives you a new hypergeometric data. Um, I'll give examples with primitive data. This came up in yesterday's talk also. If you just want to know what all the various um, possible hypergeometric data are of a given degree, you can use this function. So in degree one, there is one example um, con consisting of the rational zero and the rational one half. So those things. In degree two, there's 10 examples. Um, in degree three, uh, no, no, in degree two, there's 13 examples. 10 of them have weight one, and three of them have weight zero. Um, again, in um, degree three, everything in degree three is essentially a symmetric square of something in degree two. So you have the same number of things. And in degree four, I forget how many there are. I think it's like 147 of these um, possible things, just corresponding to every way of taking products of cyclotomic polynomials of degree four and um, uh, of and uh, matching them all together. So things you can get from a hypergeometric datum, you can ask for its weight, its degree, defining polynomials. The position, I guess, is something that's somewhat new. The symptomatic data is my um, favorite way of actually defining things in the first place. This gives you back, um, it specifies which symptomatic polynomials that um, you multiply together in order to get um, one side or the other of the symptomatic data. So for instance, three, four, four, six would look like um, the third cyclotomic polynomial times the square of the fourth times the sixth. So that would be a degree eight thing. Yeah, that would be one So this is perhaps the main functionality from the um, LSO's point of view. This is the hypergeometric trace. You give it a hypergeometric datum, a specialization T, and a prime power Q. And as long as the valuation of P of this M value times T is zero, it can compute um, um, the hypergeometric trace a la cats. It uses P and gamma functions. The first version of this um, uh, was from Henri Cohen in Paris, and then I translated it into magma. Um, that um, is what goes on for good primes. Multiplicative primes also meet this condition. A multiplicative prime is one where p divides t minus one. I think I said that in a different slide that I didn't point out. Um, and in general, magma can handle um, handles tame primes in a different way, and it doesn't handle wild primes too well. There is also a slightly more general hypergeometric trace, something that um, John Voigt got me to try to implement and at least document correctly recently. Um, the hypergeometric trace K, K here stands for a number field, um, can be Q. Um, so here you would give it just rational numbers that don't need to be Galois invariant, um, a specialization T and a prime power Q. And then it will work from a slightly different trace formula that um, doesn't use various symmetries that come about in the case when it's Galois over Q. So this is more directly from the definition of cats. Uh, this is a new one. I don't know how new it is, but John Boyd asked me a question about it, so I documented it. So its documentation is definitely new. <laughs> so I think that there is an example that will get it. Yeah. So the output is a I think it's an API. I think it's a PI number. We'll see it's does it work for all the cases, or do you, you have some limitations? Like uh, there's some limitations, like the sums of the alpha and the beta that can happen, have to be half integers or something like that. Oh, okay, so it's. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, just just whatever the conditions are that the um, that the additive character on the Gaussians won't you know, buck things up. So there's so I, there's there, there's hypergeometric traces, and then you can stick them together um, at various kinds of powers over p to get the Euler factor. And I say this is the heart of the package. It uses pietic gamma functions imputed by Henri. Um, there's various things that um, go on here. Usually you can just use it plainly, but it gives you all kinds of technical de details about, um, about, how, about how you might try, try, try to use it in more complicated ways. So there's good primes, which P doesn't divide T or T minus 1 or any of the hypergeometric data, um, or any of the spectrometric indices. The multiplicative primes um, are the ones with VP of T minus 1. I guess maybe it should just be non-zero. I don't know. No, 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 I guess it is greater than zero. Um, and it should be able to handle these also. So the P's with VP of 1 over T positive, positive correspond to monodromia at infinity. And again, Fernando's going to tell me that in his world, it's monodromia at zero. So I'm pretty sure that. Um, do you know if Sage uses the same um, conventions? No, it has it the other way around. That way we can make sure we can check our, our, our answers, and, and at least one of them will always be wrong. So, so um, the associated inertia here is given by the roots of unity here. Um, so there's examples in the, in the handbook. I don't know what that point is it's doing there. It's probably, it should be ref. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. And then there's, if you really want to be lazy and you don't want to go through hypergeometric traces or other factors, you can just ask for the L series of uh, hypergeometric datum specialized at um, a rational, which is not zero infinity. If t equals one, we'll still try to um, do it. And most of these things don't matter anymore because Magnum is becoming more and more intelligent about knowing stuff about the Hodge structure, the gamma factors, etc. Um, the bad primes, you still have to give it the bad prime, the uh, wild prime information, usually. Um, there are guesses uh, due to David Roberts and Fernando in some cases, which do work out. So another useful thing in this package is the ability to identify hypergeometric data as other objects. Um, for instance, if you take a weight zero hypergeometric um, data and um, you specialize it at T, then it will try to return an Arden representation. So this was in something that, how far have you gone up in this now? Yeah. Degree eight, you think? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Eight. Yeah, so I think that I have, I have gone up to degree three or less and some of degree four higher. And now, thanks to Pataj, I mean, there are ways of, of, of doing higher degrees. It's not in the magnet package yet, I guess. Um, I think that basically I do all the big cases. So in weight one and degree two, uh, which would correspond to an elliptic curve, you can either ask for elliptic curve over the function field or it's specialized at the parameter t. Um, there's 10 families here. Um, I think that Henri worked out all of these um, um, originally back in 2010 or so. Um, for degree four and weight one, you can ask for a hyperelliptic curve. Um, not every single one of these corresponds to a GS2 curve. Some of them correspond to elliptic curves over quadratic fields, and then this would be the right command to use. And there is a command that's just called the generic identify, which asks Magma, do you know anything about this hypergeometric data um, uh, specialized at this T? Um, can you identify it as anything? Because usually the L series computed by um, the hypergeometric motive machinery is going to be slower than if you can identify it as an elliptic curve or, a, um, or an art representation. So in more generality, if you're not just in weight zero or one, um, there's something that um, got called the canonical scheme. This is quite related to um, what we talked about yesterday and what Fritz has with Henri and Anton. Um, so this constructs, um, it takes um, this group of polynomials where you set the sum of the um, x variables and the y variables both equal to one. There's also a multiplicative relation between them. Um, and it just 
um, views of this as um, uh, a scheme. And the canonical curve then magnifies to a little bit more, then it invokes the Grometer machine, uh, the basis machinery, and tries to verify that this really does have dimension one so that it is really a curve. That's all the difference between canonical scheme and canonical curve. So um, I don't think that this says anything more. Okay. So that's an overview of the first parts of this. So now I'll give some examples. Any questions so far? So what we find with Magma is that the most difficult thing for um, users to do is give valid input. So if nothing else, I can give you some examples of, of um, valid input to Magma. Um, I think we'll have at least achieved something. OK. So um, the first example is just going to be inputting a few things. So here is the degree one um, uh, example of hypergeometric data. I've input it here as um, a pair of sequences of rationals. So the first sequence of rationals has the rational one half, and then the second one has zero, and Magma will thankfully be intelligent enough to know that this can be interpreted as a rational number, and it's not just an integer. So then I just taken an arbitrary place to specialize this, that t um, is 3 fifths, and then I asked for the Artin representations, and this is weight 0, and as I think has been seen before, this will be associated to the field q um, uh, um, adjoining the square root of t times t minus 1. So if you work that out here, this will be the field q of square root negative 24. I do some checks. This um, really is what you get here. So this Artin representation is really just a Trishley character here. It's nothing. So the second example um, will be an elliptic curve. It's in degree two. So this corresponds to the fourth cyclotomic polynomial. This is the square of the first cyclotomic polynomial. Um, here is the fourth cyclotomic polynomial. Here is the square of the um, first cyclotomic polynomial. Um, the weight is one. And then I asked for the hyperelliptic, uh, I've asked for the elliptic curve corresponding to this hypergeometric data in T, and then I've just printed it out. And it tells me that it's the elliptic curve defined by this over Q, when T is 3 halves. And then, say I want to check that this is actually um, being correct, always a good thing to do with magma. Um, magma does create lots of bugs all the time. I've taken um, various good primes, the primes in the interval from 5 to 100, the selection of three halves was cleverly made so that um, all the bad primes would be small. And then I just checked that the Euler factor for the elliptic curve um, at P, Euler factor E comma P, is equal to the Euler factor of this hypergeometric datum specialized at T, which is three halves um, at the prime P. And then this ampersand and is the way of combining everything. So everything in this array evaluates the true, and then adding them all together, that still gives you true, and that's good. That um, these two objects um, do give us the same weather factors for all the primes up to 100. So it's fairly likely that they are indeed the same object and the magnet thing is in the first place. So um, other ways of defining the hypergeometric data in the first place um, are to give it products of cyclotomic polynomials. So here I've taken the sixth cyclotomic polynomial and the second one, and the cube of the first one, and then I've given this to hypergeometric data, f comma g, and it gives it back. As, yes, this is the hypergeometric data. This is the standard um, printing way of printing out hypergeometric um, data as um, given in terms of cyclotomic indices. And here, 2 comma 6 corresponds to this product, and this is 1, 1, 1. Um, Q, the, the first component. Um, the weight of this is 2. The list of gammas, as I say, that's the thing you get the uh, um, Mobius inversion. It's this um, brackets with the stars and magma, that's a list. Um, for our purposes, um, all it is is that it's distinguished from a sequence. Um, the array is just a different way of viewing the same information, saying that you have one. Um, six, <coughs> one, three negated, and three ones that are negated. And then I computed the Euler factor here. I'm not able to identify this as anything because the weight is two. It would 
would hopefully be a surface, but I don't think we can really identify this sort of thing yet. Well, that's the executive case. Yes. This is exactly the, 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 the ones where you, where, where you can do the symmetric square from, from in this case, or a twisted symmetric square, as you said. So um, this will give you some sort of So here is an example where I decided that I want to print things out with the alphas and the betas rather than the cyclotomic indices. I don't know why I did this, except that, well, it's an option. So here is the hypergeometric data. It's given as an array of things. So this corresponds to a, um, a gamma array. So gamma of 6 is 1, um, gamma of Four is negative one, and gamma of one is negative two. So those would be exactly the things that go into the Gauss sum product. So the weight is one, and now it prints out these things in terms of the alphas and the betas. It prints out the rational numbers. You'd rather see those than the cyclotomic indices. For the cyclotomic indices, this would be three and six, and this would be um, one, one, four, I guess. And this is weight one and degree four. It turns out to be a hyperlift. Curve. I've taken the hyperlipid curve over um, the function field here, so I nicely made it so that it would print it a little bit more nicely. So um, it's this hyperlipid curve, y squared equals this sextic polynomial. This is um, the constant term here, it's the only thing that depends upon the function field parameter u. And then you can specialize this. This dollar one in magma means the previous return object. There's this thing. You can specialize this at a given t value. Um, and again, I've checked with the factors. Um, the next example is similar. I don't think I need to go through it. I don't think the twisting example is interesting. Okay. Here's an example of dealing more with these sorts of uh, schemes of varieties and other curves. And curves. So again, the first thing I did here was make sure that Magna would print out um, the function field with the rationals with the variable u. Um, then I just taken a hypergeometric datum. This is defining it via the list of things. So um, here, what this means is that gamma 3 and gamma 4 are both 1, and gamma 5 and gamma 2 are both negative. So um, I don't know if you can easily read that off from anything else that it says here. But anyway, um, asking for the canonical scheme, there's two of the variables that um, are on the plus side of this gamma list, and two of them are on the minus side. So here are the ones on the plus side. Here are the ones on the minus side. You want both of these minus 1 to be equal to 0. And then you have the multiplicative relation corresponding to taking these to the powers, and you have some rational scaling parameter. Um, and you have your specialization Q. So if you ask Magma, OK, so this is defined in, um, let me get this correct, affine four space. Is that correct? Yeah, affine four space, four variables. There's three equations. So the dimension should be 1. And it turns out that, that you can um, um, get this as a curve and ask for its genus. Its genus is 2. And perhaps unsurprisingly, if you then ask it if it is hyperlytic, it will um, say that it is. Um, then asking for the canonical curve rather than for the canonical scheme. Um, I, again, I've made it so that it prints out somewhat nicely. Here is the um, um, canonical shape of the curve. You might say, well, what is this thing? Why is it giving me some polynomials of degree 7? It's x to the 7th. Here's a y to the 7th. Well, that's, again, it's not trying to do any simplifications. And rather than a hyperlyptic model, this is um, taking the canonical curve definition as literally as possible is writing down the curve in terms of that. If you want to turn it into a hyperlyptic model, then you can do is hyperlyptic of this canonical curve, CC, and um, it will return you two things, a Boolean B, which is true, and C2, which is this um, hyperlyptic model, 
or you can just ask for it directly because this is um, sufficiently loaded that it just has a catalog of these and it will just look it up and give you the hyperlooking model y squared equals this quintic where this again is in this parameter of u. And this hyperlooked curve and the one that computed this way are indeed um, um, isomorphic. Uh, so I guess this other example is dealing with a non-primitive um, hypergeometric data. So if you, I again defining these as a list of gammas. So the only thing that the only criterion that you need for um, a list of gammas is that there's some be zero. There are six plus six minus eight minus four is zero. And you can note that everything here is a multiple of two. So um, this. Um, gives you something that's um, generically defined over a quadratic extension. For instance, back when we did um, the degree four and weight one examples, I said you can either get a hyperlyptic curve or an elliptic curve over a quadratic extension. You get elliptic curves over quadratic extensions precisely when all the gammas are divisible by two and you have an primitivity index of two. So this example actually demonstrates it for a hyperlyptic curve over a quadratic extension. So um, here, if you, take, um, you ask for the exact <coughs> constant field, and this um, is the magic incantation to um, compute this. And it gives you that, um, the, the curve here is given by this sextic polynomial, which is defined over a quadratic field, and you can give it as a hyperlyptic curve. So that's um, the that's the typical machinery for trying to uh, realize these hypergeometric motives as some sort of geometric object. Um, they say it goes through this thing that I called the conic scheme at one point. Um, I don't know if that's the best name or not, but um, at least for the curves example, you can do some things. And now we have various symmetric square examples also. We'll be there some future time. Oh, so here is the numerology of hypergeometric <coughs> data. So this is a loop to run over all the degrees from 1 to 8 and just count the number of possible hypergeometric data. So Magma is smart and it, and it knows about the symmetries that you, know, you can swap alpha and beta and that's not going to give you anything different. I mean, you can do more things with twisting there if you don't um, want other things. So I split these up by the weight. So the weight is a nice parameter. It runs from 0 to d minus 1. In degree 1, we have one example, and it has weight 0, of course. Degree 2, we have three things of weight um, 0 and 10 of weight 1. These are the symmetric squares of them. These are the things in um, um, degree 4. There's 11 things. Um, weight 0, 74 of weight 1, 30 of degree, weight 2, and 47 of weight 3. And then degree 5, 6, 7, by degree 8, there's um, a, a large number of these. So um, this gives you a way of just generating all of them um, um, in a way that you can run over a loop with them if you're interested. In. So all the zeros can be split? I mean, not, not so many. Well, I mean, these are kind of, you know, in an um, even degree, you have to, in an um, odd degree, you have to have even weight. I mean, that's fairly good. That's very good. So special hypergeometric motives. This is when you specialize at the parameter t equals 1. So Magna has a, what I call a database of these. Um, what, what we've done with Fernando and David Roberts is just take all the hypergeometric motive data up through degree 6. So you saw that there's like 1,500 different examples. Um, then we can just um, numerically determine the functional equation, and we do this computation once, and we say, since we're only, since we're only specializing in one parameter, we don't have to worry about um, um, this. And we can just compute the wild prime information once, and then it's done. So, um, are there any interesting examples here? Okay. We'll, we'll go through all the examples. So, 
What happens when you do this t plus 1 specialization? The degree either goes down by 1 or 2. It goes down by 2 in this symplectic case, I guess. Yeah. Um, when you have even degree and odd weight, and otherwise it goes down by 1. So in the case where the degree is 2, I've given all three degree 2, weight 0 examples here. Here, when you take this t plus 1 specialization, the degree only drops by 1, and so it gives you a Dirichlet L function. Um, you have one conductor 12, one of them is the Riemann zeta function, and the other one is of conductor 8. So there's also ones with art and representations. So this example is an interesting one because the Riemann zeta function becomes a factor. So this starts off with a degree 6 hypergeometric datum, um, degree 6 and weight 2 corresponding to the third cyclotonic polynomial and the eighth cyclotonic polynomial. And here, the cube of the second cyclotonic polynomial, the first cyclotonic polynomial, the sixth one. So when you take the L series um, corresponding to the specialization t equals 1, the degree drops by 1. Remember I said that it <coughs> dropped um, by 1 unless the degree was even and the weight was odd. Here, both the degree and the weight are even, so the degree drops by 1. And Magnet is smart enough to know that this L function um, of degree 5 splits as a degree 4 part, which should be related to some sort of sequel modular form, I suspect, and has a factor of a shift of the mean zeta function. Because this is a weight 2, it's a translate, it's a tape twist by 1 a bit. And you can ask for the bad prime data. Um, the conductor is actually quite small, 2 to the 7 times um, 3 squared. I guess that's 900 and, uh, well, whatever it is. Um, yeah, 1152. And then you can check the functional equation. This stands for check functional equation. That's the old version of it. And there's also a new version, CFE new. And this checks this bad prime information, and you get 0 to 30 digits, and that um, is the numerical check point. That this is the correct Euler factors at um, 2 and 3, and also the correct exponents, 2 to the 7th and 3 squared. So they say this um, degree 4 part should be related to some single modular form, expect, but um, I don't think that that seems, seems not to be feasible to actually um, give it as such. about this. So there's some what I call exotic examples where these, I mean, that, that example is there. It was degree 5 and split up as degree 1 plus degree 4. There's some that split up um, from degree 4 into degree 2 plus 2. So here is one example. It starts in degree 6 and the weight is 1. So this is a symplectic example, so the degree goes down by 2 when you do the specialization. And this L series turns out to be the product of these two L series corresponding to these two elliptic curves, 400C and 1200L. I don't know um, particularly why those are interesting ones, but that just turns out to be a sporadic example. I call it that. So here's the example that um, Fritz was talking about yesterday with six twos and six ones. I think this was um, the one that he um, had at hand, that he knew that it was level 8. It turns out to be, um, um, so if you just look at what this is, it has weight 5, and generically it has degree 6, because it's symplectic, it drops by degree 2 when you take the t equals 1 specialization, and this gives you um, the weight 6 level 8 um, new form, and a tape twist of the one of weight 4 and level 8. So that's what this translate does here. It, it takes a tape twist of this. And this L series is the product of those two. And it's not exactly the um, example of 8 1s and 8 2s that Fritz also talked about. But if you twist that one by, I guess, 1 6th or something, you get 4 3s and 4 6s. And here you get something that's a level 36 and um, weight 6 for the modular form. So um, the last <coughs> topic I have is actually something that's simpler than hypergeometric modus. David Roberts um, 
managed to give me to um, implement these also, so we'll go back to some theory. So these are um, Jacobi submotives, or Jacobi, do I say in this country? Or, I mean, <laughs> Jacobi, okay. Jacobi submotives. Um, these are related to the team prime information of hypergeometric motives. So there is a paper of um, they where he talks about uh, um, um, evaluating these in terms of groups and characters. And this is exactly what the Magma package does at the end of the day. It's, um, it has a, it has a reciprocity correspondence where you give it um, a, a um, Jacobi motive and it um, gives you back a Grossian character um, to which um, it corresponds. And it's much easier to compute with, with um, Grossian characters. So um, let me remind you of the background <laughs> here. So I guess this is um, the formulation of um, Schopenhauer or Anderson, not quite sure. Um, Schopenhauer has a book on um, periods of algebraic type of characters, where I think he goes through a lot of this. So what you have um, is a integral linear combination of rationals modulo one. So Q mod Z, that's rationals modulo one. These are your integral coefficients. And you're just taking a formal sum of, of these in the free group on, on Q mod Z. And um, the condition, again, relating to the fact that your Gaussian product should not depend upon this additive character is that if you map this down, that the sum of nj um, xj um, is integral. So um, then the thing that we're going to be interested in is in this type of Gaussian. So this is defined for um, an ideal proctor P, which is in a subfield of a cyclotomic field. So there is a class, standard class field where field theory way of getting the correct subfield of the cyclotomic field. And then once you take any prime above P, you can define this Gauss sum here. So this is a generalized power residue symbol um, corresponding to the denominator M of your rational number. You're raising to the eighth power. And then there's this um, um, non-trivial additive character that you choose. At the end of the day, it won't matter when you take it. And you evaluate the trace of the field um, corresponding to the prime ideal. So this will have, say, Q elements. You trace it down to FP, um, and then you evaluate the additive character there. So what does this give you? So in the same way that we had the hypergeometric datum, we gave it a prime, and, it's, and it gave us back an Euler factor. So here we have this object. Theta, which is a formal sum of elements over Q mod uh, Z satisfying some properties, we give it a prime ideal um, in a, a subfield of a cyclotomic field, and it gives us back some product of Gauss sums. Um, and this um, defines the um, Jacobi sum um, for good primes, um, proctor P, up, 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 up to a choice of um, roots of unity in C. So there is um, some care needed to know whether or not things are defined over um, the Euler factors will be defined over the rationals or over this um, subfield of the cyclotomic field. Um, from the standpoint of L function comp computations, this becomes a finite problem because they already gives you a bound on the conductor. You know all the information about good primes, so you, you can just you know the finite space of Grossian characters with the right um, infinity type, etc. So you can just go through um, and just do linear algebra and compute the um, um, Jacobi sum evaluations at um, enough prime, um, small prime ideals, and that will give you precisely one um, possible heck of Grossian character, and then you'll have identified it as that. Um, you can also do something more with this, so you can take Coomer and Tate twists. So a Coomer twist um, is just um, twisting the trace formula by T to the row for some rational T and um, for some non-zero T and rational row between zero and one. I'll give some example of this. Tate twisting is just um, moving it up and 
down with the weight. And David Roberts came up with the clever idea of calling this a jacket motive for the Kobe Coomer intake. So here are the creation functions. So what do you give the Jacobi motive function? You give it um, two sequences of rationals, one corresponding to the positive and one corresponding to the negative elements of this, uh, in this um, um, for, for formal sum on the, on the free group. Um, you can give it um, optional arguments corresponding to the Coomer, Tate, um, and Tate twists, or you can define it with the jacket motive command with A, B, your T to the row, and your twisting parameter J. So then you can just do basic arithmetic with these. You can take their tensor product, so that's the time sign. You can take their tensor quotient. You can check if they're equal. There's a scaling parameter, which I'll give an example of, um, that you can scale all the rational numbers in, out, in um, A and B. Um, by, a, by, a, by a giving a rational number. And this will give you the same motive over Q, but um, need only be conjugate over the larger field. So then there's various things you can get from it. You have the field of definition, the weight, the effective weight, that's the width of its Hodge structure. And in general, with, with Maggie, you can ask for its Hodge structure of an, of an L-series. Um, I didn't do it with the hypertermetic mode. I didn't give an example because it can depend upon whether the parameter t is between 0 and 1 or 1 and infinity, things like that. So um, it's, you can't get a hard structure on a hypertermetric data. You can only get it on specialization in that case. So. And again, you have the L function. You can ask for the Euler factor. You give it a jacket motive in general and a rational prime P and um, a good prime ante. We'll compute the Euler factor using the above way of um, doing it with Gauss sums and p adic gamma functions. This, in general, is not the way that you want to work. What you want to do is identify it as a gruesome character and then compute its Euler factors. But First, you have to bootstrap the way to be able to identify it as, the, as, as a gross character in the first place. Um, another thing you can do is you can ask for the complex evaluation instead of doing things in terms of p-adic gamma functions. So you can write down the Gauss sums over the complex numbers. And then you can evaluate the, I think it's not just a Yakni motive, it's, it's a jacket motive, at a prime ideal um, good, uh, it needs to be a good prime ideal of degree one over the um, subfield of the spectrometric field. And this is probably the most useful command. You give it um, your Yagami motive, and it returns you a Grossman character. And as I say, this just goes through the linear algebra and computes the enough good primes. So here are some examples. This is sort of the first one, I think, that Schaffer mentions. You take two copies of two thirds and one of one third. So the, so this meets the compatibility condition um, because two thirds plus two thirds minus one third is an integer. Its weight is one. Its weight is one because you have two things here and one thing there, and two minus one is one. So the weight is the number of positive things minus the number of negative things naturally. That's not necessarily the effective weight, which um, could be different. So the field here is the number field defined by the um, third cyclotron polynomial, I guess, q which minus to three. And then I've just done them, done some things to check that the other factors for the um, Jacobi motive are actually equal to the elliptic curve 27a. This is just an example of complex multiplication. So um, this is degree two and weight one. You can guess it in the elliptic curve. Um, it's going to have to have complex multiplication and, um, corresponding um, to the, one. I guess this is the more delta. This is yeah, this is the, the curve of connected 27. So then you can, um, this elliptic curve allows cubic twists. You can twist it by 2 to the 1 third and get um, the elliptic curve connected 108, which is 4 times 27. Um, similarly, you can know, twist it by 4 to the 1 third. You can also take a quadratic twist. Um, it's twisted here by negative 2. Um, the comment is wrong, I realize that. Um, here is 
Another example, so here I've taken something um, one seventh, two sevenths, and four sevenths. So you might guess that this will be somehow related to the Klein, to the Klein quartet and the field Q adjoint square root negative seven, and possibly elliptic curves of conductor 49. So here, everything is in one side of the um, Jacobi motive. I didn't define any negative things. You can just give it one argument, and it's perfectly happy. So here, the scaling of the motive by two or four will give you the same thing if you multiply by everything by two, you get two sevenths, four sevenths, one seventh, just in a different order. If you multiply it by three, five, or six, then you'll get a conjugate um, motive over um, Q adjoining square root negative seven. So the field is indeed um, Q adjoining square root negative seven, and is that defined polynomial? The weight is three. There's three things in the positive side and zero in the negative. The effective weight, though, is only one. Um, I don't know an easy way to um, compute that. You can just compute the Hodge structure. It's an easy way. So, the, so you, you'll have to t-twist this by one if you want to um, get the um, something of weight one. And then I checked that this really is corresponding to the elliptic curve of conductor 49. And then I've invoked the Grossing character command. And it tells me that um, corresponding to this, um, the um, Jacobi motive is a Grossing character of infinity type one comma two. So this is a conjugate place, places that infinity for um, a pair of Hecke character. There's a dress rate characters of modulus of norm seven over this number field. And you can ask it more what this pair actually is. It's just a um, standard way of, of defining a, a Grossing character. As I say, the main thing about that is that it will allow you to compute much faster with the L series if you want. So, um, so are, are there some hypergeometric modules of degree four or five that happens also to be Jacobian? I don't know. I'll get to the example where um, the team prime information from the hypergeometric modus shows up in the um, in the Jacobian modus. I think mean, that that's the main connection. I don't know if they're exactly the same motives. So I think this example just gives you, show, it, it, it shows you how to do some arithmetic with these things. I don't know how useful that is. Okay, so here is, here is the relation between the Kobe motives and bad prime information for hypergeometric motives. So the most natural thing to do to use on the hypergeometric motive side is, again, this list of gammas. And I'm sure that um, other people will switch to zero and infinity. So here, I've chosen this list of gammas. This adds up to 15. This adds up to negative 15. So that's a um, valid list of gammas. And then magma prints out the cyclotomic indices, which are 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 6, and 5, 5, 5. This is of weight three. And then the way to go from the team prime information to this Jacobi motive. So I want the positive parts to be the things in the gamma list, um, which are positive, and I divide them by five. So that will give me one fifths, two fifths, three fifths, three fifths, six fifths. And on the negative side, I'm just going to get a bunch of zeros, which, um, well, they don't matter. I mean, you can. You, you, you can keep them in there and keep track of them, but for practical purposes, this is just the Jacobi motive given by 2 times 1 fifths plus 2 fifths plus 2 times 2 fifths. <coughs> the 6 and the 1 give you the 2, the 1 fifths. And then I'm just going to take a prime that's 1 mod 5 for simplicity, and I'm going to ask for the team prime information um, corresponding to this. So here, I've taken my hypergeometric data, I've taken a t value, which has 11 to the fifth in the denominator. So this is, in theory, a bad prime, um, because uh, p is now, a, p, p equals 11 is now a bad prime because it divides the denominator. However, it divides it to the fifth, and this does a um, um, action uh, corresponding to the fifth power at infinity. So this turns out to have a perfectly good degree four Euler factor at p equals 11. And its um, weight drops from weight three, it drops by two because you have three, um, three minus one copies of five. 
And this is the same Euler factor as of this Jacobian motor. That the T twisted by two to get the um, right weight. And this, in general, is true. You have um, 10 different possibilities here corresponding to multiplying um, through by any number from 1 to 10. And this list of Euler factors is exactly the same as this list of Euler factors. So these are all congruent modulo 5 and other things if you want to look at that also. But for, from, for the purposes of figuring out what the Euler factor of a high geometric motive is, in terms of the um, Jacobi motives, this gives you an exact recipe for doing it. And the same is I've done the easier case um, corresponding to the shorter list of three fives here. Um, here, there's only one thing to worry about. At the other um, singularity, at t equals zero, then you have to worry about each of one, two, three, and six. And I think I give the answer here. It's slightly more complicated to actually figure out what it is. But in the end, you get, again, the same bad order factors for the geometric motive precisely from these Yachty motives. So that's, that was one of the original reasons why we were, we, we were interested in um, implementing the, the um, Jacobian motives with the hypergeometric motives, though I think we understand that in the team primes in a different way now, so we don't need any of this. So, okay, so that's, that's the end of the chapter, so I think that ends my talk. Thank you. I think I try to do that, that at one level. I mean, if there's like six things, then I try to split them up into two and four or something like that. Yeah, well, you, I you use can, one trick and they use three. You can do it in many ways, ways, but you can always definitely find the smallest yeah. dimension. The yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and no more questions. So I have a question. So if I understand what you're doing, you have a family of things depending on the parameter t. Yes. And you analyze uh, the nice t's. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So can you find out back the features of the family? So it, you started out with a hypergeometric differential equation, and so you have monodromy. Is there somehow some way to find this monodromy back in the features of the L functions which you produce. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's not clear whether so the corresponding modules, the, the, I mean the differential equation for the uh, variety would be exactly the hypergeometric one. It's, it's an open question in general. Uh -huh. So how can you yeah, how, how can you do the things you want to do? No. Well, I mean, you can always just try to look at the degree one case, you know, where you have Q's square root C times the mother. Even that, you know, if you need to learn something. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, are there more questions? Will it be picture first and co-fill to you next? <laughs> the important questions. <laughs> well, I have here the, 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 the announcement is that at 10.30, and it's 10.30 now, till 11, there will be a group photo and a coffee break. So I was here at one workshop before, uh, in January, and then it turned out we had to gather in the coffee room there, and then somebody would come up with a, with a photo, with a, make photos, yeah, in, in the garden there. So I don't know what they do today, but I don't know. So I, I propose to go to the coffee break, but not to quickly pour your coffee, just wait for new instructions. It occurred to me a question. Okay. <laughs> How can I learn uh, using this stuff? They're both here for a, couple, for a few days. You just ask Mark to sit down with you. And okay. 
I mean, there is a magma online calculator. That's you don't have a magma so uh -huh. you can compete with this. But there are so many commands, and you know the quick thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, but, yeah I mean, of course, I'm ten times faster than. You already complained about Bagla, and you haven't even used it yet. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Jim. Yeah, I mean, okay. If there are no more questions, I suppose we'll go to the coffee room. And I don't want big smile because